What's up guys, Jody Dean here, Mr. Hunting the Dead. Right now, I'm getting ready to interview the woman that we all know, that we all love. She's an amazing woman, Patty Negri. I know you guys have seen her on Ghost Adventures before. Um, she's a friend of mine here, and we are getting ready to talk. I'm going to ask her some questions. We may even do a spirit box session. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Before we move forward, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and be sure to turn on those notifications. All right, here we go. Oh, I felt pressure all over my body. Is this yours? My name is Jody Dean. That's why I jumped. I heard a loud hit behind me. Real human bones. And when it comes to the paranormal, I don't play no fucking games. Is there anything here? Oh my god! It's in my god! I'm known as Mr. Hunting the Dead on my channel, Hunting the Dead on YouTube. Feel you in here, man. Come on. Give me <laughs> I've been on the news for hunting some of the most haunted places in the state of Florida. In less than two years, I have over 4.9 million views and 64,000 subscribers. He's a one-man band. Very knowledgeable. I love Jody Dean. He's one of the best out there. What? No, thank you. I'm gonna have to go back and look, but I think those cabinets, I think those were open. I just fucking heard something right here. What, what the, the fuck? fuck? Dude, oh my god, dude! Shit, man, all I want to do is hunt the fucking paranormal. Patty, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good, good to see you. How are you doing in California there right now? I am good. It's a beautiful day. We have a few clouds, which we desperately need, because between the fires and the heat, um, we're hoping for rain in, enough, in a couple days, so it's all good, but it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> but your, your home and your family is okay? Yes. I, li I do live in, in a hilly area. I live in the Hollywood Hills, and when the, the first day the fire started, there was one not close enough that I was worried, but right here in Griffith Park, by right. the Hollywood sign, and it was, it was kind of close to the zoo, so they were having to evacuate animals, but they got that one out really fast. Good. But, I mean, I sadly know a lot of people who lost everything. Right. I know. Yeah, it's very sad. Well, I'm glad that you are okay and your family's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and thank you for letting me do this interview with you. Um, as I told you, there's a, a lot of people I know personally who just love you to death. I love you to oh, death. Thanks. I think, absolutely, I, I think that um, you're one of those people, you have such a positive energy. It shines through in your, in your smile, and it, it's just a better world having you here. So, Aww, thank you. Okay, so one of the first things that I would like to ask you is how old were you when you first started noticing your abilities? And when did they really become strong? Like, when did you feel like, okay, now I'm, 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 I'm taking this to another level? I was really, really young when I first noticed anything. I, I didn't even know it was different. I literally remember being a toddler, three years old, and I just kind of knew that those imaginary friends little kids have were not all imaginary by any means. Means They were real beings and entities that I could communicate with. Um, most were not scary. There were some scary ones and there were some not scary ones. Um, and I didn't realize that it was not a normal thing. <laughs> and my parents were very supportive, especially my mom was just like, oh, yeah, grandma had that, too. No big deal. Uh, so it wasn't like, oh, this is evil or the devil's got you or anything like that. So it was just part of what I was. And I was always a little obsessed with the other side with not death as in morbid, but in communicating with the other side because I just knew you could. So I literally did my first seance. I was seven or eight years old in my little suburban hallway um, I, with my best friend, Sherry Jones. I just, I'm going to do a seance. And I didn't even know what that was. I came up with my first chance. I have a bunch of this stuff just born in me, I guess. Um, then I realized I didn't know dead people. So uh, Marilyn Monroe and John Kennedy, they're dead. I can them. I'll call them in. So again, I came up with my first incantation or whatever. And within minutes, my windowless, lightless, little suburban hallway filled with lights and orbs and spirits 
Sherry and I went running out screaming, but on the inside, I was like, yes, I knew it. This is real. This is something I can control. I can manipulate. I can communicate with. So thus began my lifelong being a seeker, a searcher. I've studied um, paranormal, occult sciences, metaphysics, cosmologies, philosophies, religion, my entire life, put it, getting a handle on it and putting it into a package that I take it down to, to energy. Everything is energy. So even whatever your belief system or to me, whatever template you put on top, um, you have something to work with, uh, like a navigating route, whatever that is. So I was young. I it's just always been a part of me. I did shut it down a little, I think, in my youth. It's just like, oh, I just want to be normal. I just want to be a normal girl. In those teen years, you know, I'd wear a hat to keep in my body and just shut up, shut up. But now I've learned how to completely control it after all these decades. And I can turn it on and turn it off. I don't want to be in the grocery store, you know, like Long Island Medium. I think she's great, but I don't want, but she's on TV. I don't, I don't want to be like, your mother wants to talk to you. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, not my business unless you ask. <laughs> not my business. And I don't even think that's appropriate. Right. So it's good. Now I get the best of all worlds. It makes the when you're on that side of the veil or open to it, okay, now I'm opening it up that much stronger. And then you cross back over the, the head, you cross back over the broom, or you cross back over the line. And then I can be a regular person again. Okay, that was very, very well said, and I can relate to so, so much of that. I felt like two brains in one head for, for a second there. Um, and it's very inspirational that you dealt with it the way that you did, and people were supportive of it, and how you talked about turning it on and turning it off. Um, same thing here. You know, I, I, I this is something that just came to me more or less in the last few years out of nine years of doing it. Um, that it's so strong that sometimes you do have to turn it off. It can become so much. And I was going to ask you that next. Um, how hard is that to do? With practice, it's not hard at all. It's just figuring out how to do it because everybody might have a whole different method of doing it. Um, it's all based on intent to me, but you know, you might want to dance on your foot three times around and wave a thing around. You might use a certain herb or an oil. I think everybody is different. However, your mind body connection is, um, like I said, it, when I was a kid in the eighties, I, I couldn't do it at all. And then I, I knew out of desperation I had to learn to do it and the trial and error. Now I could just turn it on and off like that. But it, again, it, it doesn't have to be hard. It's just, it's hard to teach somebody else. I could teach somebody else all sorts of methods. Okay, we're going to do a breathing method. We're going to do an intention method. We're going to do a, a, a ritual method. We're going to do a spell working, whatever we're doing. But that person has to figure out, oh, this is the one that really aligns with me and works for my spirit and my energy. I want to ask about the craft. Uh, how did the craft come into your life? Were you born? Were you born into it? Were you raised around it? When did you find it? How has it impacted your life? And um, what does it what does it mean to you? Like I said, um, I wasn't raised with any overpowering belief system. In fact, my grandfather was uh, this big philosopher, psychoanalyst. Um, um, practically evangelical atheist. He hung out with, he was a Hollywood guy. He hung out with Carl Sagan, Isaac Asimov. Steve Allen was his best friend, Norman Lear. All these very intellectual, very anything religious or spiritual is, is a weakness to my grandfather. And this is what I grew up with. My parents were just kind of nothing. I, I'd never been in a church or a temple. Um, my father would have been Sephardic Jewish. My mother would have been Protestant Christian, but God was a, not a dirty word, but just not a said word. I would, and with my gift, I would drive by a, a church or a temple or a mosque or any building and I would see the energy and I'd, I'd want to go in to see what that spirit was, but I was afraid to ask of this weird, scary religion word. So I remember I was 13 years old and that was in the, those Jesus people, the born again and really cute rock bands. And my, there was a, this cute Christian band and my girlfriend was going, inviting me to church. And I remember working up the bravery to ask my mom if I could go to church on Friday night to hear a Christian rock band. I, I might have been more comfortable asking my mom, hey, can I go to an orgy or a drug field party down the street? I might have felt more comfortable asking that than if I could go to this God place. And luckily, my mom's answer was, of course, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, 
oh, yay. So thus began my journey. So I started out with all the traditional religions. Christian, number one, born again Christian, number that was it. And I was like, this isn't, it's good. I see the good parts of it, but this isn't quite right for me. Number one, I don't want to be a sheep. Number two, I don't want it for me to ask about Buddhism for their belief system at the time to believe it's a sin to ask a Buddhist about Buddhism. You need to ask a Christian about Buddhism. And that didn't set right with me, or that's what I was given at that time. Um, I tried, okay, I'm going to go to my half Judaistic rites. And like, that was good. They have some like ritual and storytelling. Then I'm like, oh, it's again all new agey and Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. And then the Shirley MacLaine and the new age and the crystals came in. And like, oh, this is better. This is better. This is spirituality and not religion. I don't want the confines of religion. That doesn't work for me. Um, and then I got real new agey for a little while, but that was just a little too squeaky clean for me as well. It's a fluffy white goddess, everything. And I liked it, but it, I knew there was some more, I needed more meat. I needed more substance. Right. And then, and then I found, I think I was at Long Beach Women's Spirit. I went to a ritual. I knew some people who, it was, it was, I think it was a Wiccan gal gallery, but it was Long Beach Women's Spirit. And it was introduced to the pagan culture. And I'm like, oh, oh, I get this. So now I'm, I'm in charge of my own destiny. I charge right and wrong and what it is. So thus began my into the pagan field. And I started out very traditional goddess worship Wiccan, um, which was great. And it really worked. And over the years, and now decades, it's really branched out. It's like, okay, this is good, but this is becoming even a little religion-like for me. I want the spirituality of it. I want the craft of it. Because to me, to be a witch, to witchcraft is two different things. To be a witch, or you could, that could be a religion, or it could just be a practice. Right. Yes, it is a belief system for me, but more than anything else, it's a practice. It's, I believe we can change fate. I believe we could take fate into our own hands in life with spell working and magic. And um, being a good witch, I believe we have to do it in integrity. And if you don't personally know your own sense of ethics or right and wrong, don't do it. Follow somebody else's path where they tell you what's right and wrong, or you'll get into trouble. Um, but I started learning um, a little more, more conjure magic, a little more ceremonial magic, a little British traditional magic, Peruvian shamanism, and all of these things together, again, whether they're elemental based or air based. And again, just like I did with the religion, saw the through line to it. So now I throw all of it into one great big cauldron and then create my own truth, which I think that's what we get to everybody discovering their own, how it works for them, my own personal spirituality. Uh, you know, and even when I teach people, when I work with people, it's not, you're going to follow me, you're going to be, you know, a Salemic witch or a ceremonial witch or a chaos magician or a Wiccan or this or that. No, here is some basic stuff. You figure out what you are and maybe you're not going to fit into a single one of those categories, which I believe is true for me right now. But it's right. part of, it is who I am and it's my practice of every day. I'm sitting here with, you know, right next to me, herbs and oils and things and all this stuff. This is my daily life. <laughs> Right. You seem like a solitary a eclectic, in, in, yeah. if anything. Um, yeah, that's what I am. I am eclectic. I, I'm a bit of a hedge witch. Like I said, they go both sides of the veil. Right. I'm a bit green witch because I believe in the environment. I'm a bit of this and I'm a bit of that. Um, but I'm a witch, I'm a pagan, and that's about as, as specific as I can guess. <laughs> a witch is a witch. A lot of people do make it out to be so stressful um, out there yeah. than other than just finding their, their path just by doing it and getting their feet dirty and learning through the trial and error. And, and that's how I came into it is I just seen what worked for me and I stuck with that. And you add, you take away, and you do it, and you, you feel your powers more and more as the time goes by. So... Ghost Adventures. How did how did you hook up with Ghost Adventures? How did that come into play? Um, were you were you were you friends with these people? Obviously, you're friends now. They love you. Thank God. You know we love seeing you on there. Um, tell us tell us about that and how that came all, all about. So um, how I got hooked up with Ghost Adventures was a little bit fluky. I had already been I do a lot of reality television. I kind of just being in Hollywood and doing so much television and being coming from that world as well. Since I think about 2008, when my production company, because I have a live production company, live shows. 
that corporate market started crashing and reality started going up. I remember my first show I was doing a seance was a thing like I thought nobody would watch mobile home disaster on CMT mm -hmm. and people did watch it. And then all of a sudden I'm doing everybody's show. I'm doing pit boss. I'm doing flipping out. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. So I think somehow I became, I got a name for myself that um, she's legit. She's got a talent, this whatever given talent. She's actually good on camera. She knows that world. That's her world. So kind of the go-to if they needed either a, a medium, a psychic, or a witch, or whatever. But the ghost adventures, I don't know how much, I don't know who found me, but it was the um, Haunted Hollywood episode. I got a call that they were doing Haunted Hollywood, and they had heard that I had experienced the ghost of Charlie Chaplin in the beautiful uh, American Legion in here in Hollywood. So it was going to be like a one-day little go in like he does the interviews with people. So that happened, and we just started talking and got to know each other a little bit, real slowly at first. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I think, I don't know what came. Next. Then it just started bombarding in. Oh, we need you at a seance for the Black Dahlia murder. Okay, we've got this haunted doll, Peggy. Let's do a seance there. I want you to feel out the Chatsworth house. Then I started sending them places like, okay, you're going to love this Reseda house because I can't clear it. It's the darkest place I've ever been. So even some episodes that uh, I'm maybe not even very much at all or at all, like Ripley's, I sent them to Ripley's. They trust me enough. They've just been vetted enough that they know that what I'm going to give them is legit. Um, so it's really fun. I'm honored that I got to do the last two Halloween shows. This one was crazy. I might yeah. have that. The, the live one was really hard and for everybody. Um, but it just, it was a, honestly a natural progression. It was a little bit organic. I didn't force it. I didn't send them my information. It wasn't begging to be on the show. Um, honestly, for several years before I was on it, I would watch the show. I'd see the, the truth there, and I, but I'm like, who are these big macho guys in the tight t-shirts who, you know, provoke ghosts and then run like little girls <laughs> when a pin drops? It's like, well, but I get it. The second I met him, I go, oh, because this is commitment. This is 100. They give 110% of everything they do, right. 110%. And I, again, because to me, integrity is everything. And they are the most legit I have ever seen. They will keep me locked in a car or in a room sequestered so I do not know where I am or what it is. There is no hints. There is no tips. It's like you walk in blind. You tell us what's going on. They want it real reactions, real everything. Um, and that means the world to me. It's scary, too, because I'm like, what if I get crickets? What if I don't see anything? What if I don't? What if I can't raise the dead? What if I? What? But um, but to, to me, it's it's the most they're honorable and they're it's crazy and fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is, that is amazing. Um, I think that they are great myself. Uh, it was one of the people uh, on TV at the time that got me into the field years ago as uh, Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures, and I pretty much did the same thing, like how you just said, you know, like who are these guys, these macho guys doing this? Well, I kind of was watching these guys too, and I'm like, okay, you know, if they see a shadow, they run up a door, and I didn't really believe in the paranormal. Well, it made me go out and get my first devices and try and see if I could capture what they were using the same thing. And I did, and it changed my life. I quickly became addicted, and now it's nine years later, 750 investigations later. And it's like, wow, wow you know, I actually have to pay homage to, to these people because uh, if I wouldn't have been inspired to try it, I'd never be here right now. So. Right. Um, any plans in the future anybody approached you anything in the works any shows coming anything like that um you know patty getting her own show here i mean that would be really really nice uh anything like that approached you recently it's funny you say that but yes but yes i really cannot respond to that i actually have a couple of projects in the work working with a couple producers who I love and I've known for years from other shows and things. So it's in those early pitch product, product, you know, pitch parts of things. So I can't talk too much about it, but there's some really good stuff out there. Cause I do have an idea of, you know, my ideal of show I wouldn't want. Yes. It's paranormal. Yes. It's using all my gifts, but again, maybe adding a little more resolution, maybe adding a little more learning curve to things for people. So people can go away a little more empowered and a little more understanding of things. But we'll see what happens. I still get to do, I, I'm, fun stuff is coming up all the time. I just did this French TV show. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like PBS, a French PBS. It's a big show, um, a six or nine week series on um, sex. 
And the, the, the episode they flew out for me from Paris was uh, the paranormal side of sex. And I'm considered an international expert uh, on spectrophilia, which is ghost human sex. Um, so <laughs> it was great doing it non from sensationalized, not from like, ooh, let's see that, you know, from this really scientific perspective, because, you know, people think ghosts are controversial, the craft is, you know, put sex and ghosts together. It's like, wah! <laughs> but having this beautiful French, you know, PBS kind of crew coming out. Um, so I'm really lucky that along with that TV line, there's, I get to do really fun stuff out there. Some of it never seen in the U.S. I do a lot foreign. Some God knows where you could find it, but it's somewhere. <laughs> So I was seeing, um, I was seeing online that you do things like seances at your home here, and people can actually come and do this with you, which is pretty amazing. And I'm thinking about doing it myself, maybe sometime next year, if you're still doing it. Um, so tell us about that. I mean, how often do you do that? What can somebody expect? How long does it last? And uh, what kind of crazy stuff have you guys happened so, had had happened so far? Okay. Yes, I do seances regular, especially this time of year. Near Samhain, Halloween, for regular folks, the month before, the month after, when the veil is really, really thin. I did probably three in October. I just did one last night, and I'm going to do at least one in December, where people could just come for a real a very affordable price. And we're going to spend the whole night. We're going to, I mean, not all night, like till 6 a.m., but many hours below the veil. I work, you as a craft member, I work elementally. So I use the air, the fire, the water, earth. I, that's the wards and guardians I work. So I don't conflict with anybody's belief system. We lift the veil. So besides me being a medium, they can really experience. So I'll be lay people around the table who are there. They're the one getting messages. And I say, trust it. And I have, I get the veil so high that people can see things, be touched by things, get information. I'm mostly old school. I'm very Victorian in my seance style. Mm -hmm. uh, bells and chimes and uh, dowsing rods is how I talk to them. Ouija boards. I've been using a Ouija since I've, I have the same one I've had since I was a little kid. I have dozens Ooh. now. Um, but I also, just being modern technology, I'll throw in a couple EMF meters on the table, ghost radars, things like that. Um, but it's really sweet because people get to experience, and it's not scary. I, I, I tell people it's not going to be what you see me on Ghost Adventures or Sell Your Soul to Satan or these different shows. We're only going to invite in your deceased loved ones and died. So it's, again, real empowering. It's real informative. And I've gotten amazing stuff. I mean, I've gotten literally um, an iPhone code. This a young man passed an illness and leaving his young wife and child. And... They couldn't get in his iPhone. And this was about the time that Apple was, the FBI was trying to get into Apple's phone, that Apple wouldn't give them an iPhone code. It's like, well, they should have just used a Ouija board to talk to me. I was able to get the iPhone code so they could get into the camera and get the videos off and stuff. So the seance is here. You come in, we sit down within a half an hour. It usually goes three hours. But that's an average. It could, it could go longer. If people need to leave, we let them. I close the veil. But again, people usually go with a whole new understanding of the other side um, and some information. Now, pretty much everybody gets to talk to at least one person or somebody from their past. And, you know, I'll come up with names. I'll come up with whatever. Um, so it's, it's really cool. I like, again, regular people, muggles, lay people to get to really experience it. Now, right. outside of what I offer at the home, if I'm going somewhere that people, again, with like the TV shows or you're going into a dark house or a serial killer's house, um, I've had crazy things. Um, I think the most crazy that wasn't a TV thing, though we filmed it, was I was at this house right here near me. I live in the Hollywood Hills, old 1920s neighborhood. And this house was built by Charlie Chaplin for his mistress, Mary Astor, who was an old movie star, party girl. And then they were crazy parties there. And then the Rolling Stones manager bought it. So the Rolling Stones lived there, the Mamas and Papas, Graham Parsons. Then the person who grew up, uh, who built the real life sex doll. And then most recently, my neighbor was Marilyn Manson, lived and recorded oh, there. Man. It actually got, the house got too scary for Marilyn Manson. <laughs> um, and, and he moved out. But I was doing a seance there, part of a doc, it was part of a documentary, I guess that part's out there. But so they had two cameras. And I brought a bride crew and brought two cameras going, if we're going to do this, because this house was really dark. Um, 
because there was cranky ghosts. They're not necessarily demonic, just cranky. Big in life, big in death. You know, Bob the banker is a fine ghost, but the rock star banker, I mean, the rock star ghost is going to be bigger. And um, so I tell the young people around the table, and I, I tell them, it's like, you know, skeptic, okay, try to be open. But the one thing you have to do is you have to be respectful. Because when you lift the veil, they don't do well with lack of respect. So believe or don't believe, but but be respectful. And this one kid, maybe because he was being on TV or on camera, was just kind of being an ass, kind of being an idiot. He would say smart aleck and stuff. We're getting real information. I, I felt the ghosts getting angry. And first, cool things were happening, like the French doors flew open, like almost like special effects, but we have no special effects. And I wouldn't do that if we had them, unless that was stated, that's what it is. Right. And then it happened again. And then the speakers on the floor came on, <sighs> this white noise and... We look later, they weren't even plugged in. But anyway, it was building and building and all this stuff going on. And finally, this kid said, we got some really good information about some horrible thing that had happened to the 20s in the basement, some sex, whatever, slave. And all of a sudden, he said something ridiculous. And not him, but my cameraman facing him, shooting him, literally burst into flames. Spontaneous combustion, like angel wings of fire. His whole back went up in flames, like, like in a V, like... Will it? Angel wings of fire. Everybody starts screaming. We're kind of in a small space, this very haunted looking house. Everybody's screaming. I, two of the cameras actually captured it, went there. Two of the cameras like hit the floor, hit the ceiling. So I guess you test the metal of a cameraman ah, when the room is bursting into flames. And all of a sudden, <laughs> me, cool, you know, medium witch Patty becomes medic Patty, which I am too. I was like, drop and roll. And I'm calling in my guardians and my protectors and how I work. Everybody's screaming. We can't say it. We get the fire out fast. His shirt burnt off him like it was synthetic, but it was a cotton. It shouldn't have burnt off that like that. But there was some blistering. And I'm like, we are done. We are done. And uh, amazingly, the guy who caught on fire was like kind of inspired by it. He's like, no, no, no. Continue on. Continue on. I, I've got a sweater. He took off the burnt shirt and had a sweater. I'm like, well, all right, but you have to go to the doctor because those burns, all right, they look kind of bad on the small of his back. The kid in question, the idiot kid, got really, really well behaved. <laughs> I will, he won't be an idiot any longer. So he got really behaved. I really talked to the ghost. I laid, laid in more protection, more warding. And we actually turned into an okay thing. Um, the trip, but again, it was kind of, they tried to push him off the cliff, my cameraman. I had to do some work for him. But the coolest thing that happened with that. Besides that, he was really inspired. He ended up writing a movie with Stephen Norrington, the guy from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and the oh, Blade okay. series about almost really a story of a TV psychic who's doing another TV show. And then a portal opens and then it turns into a horror film. <laughs> but I, they haven't even done it yet. But I sat down with him going, nope, can't say that on camera. Nope, can't say that on camera. That's a real incantation. Can't say that. That's how films get cursed so i'm like let's do some makeup words right here unless you want it to be you know exorcist so but anyway what's cool is he showed me in three weeks this where the blisters were on the small of his back literally looked like he had went and got a tattoo of a dragon he didn't he had the open mouth the, the teeth the, the fringed wings ears into the shape of a serpent and it looks like he went and got a tramp stamp of a dragon on the small of his back i work dragon magic that's the energy I pulled in to stop it. So that was like, ah, you know, from something that could have been a tragic thing was so powerful and so cool, you know, and then he's got the best story and he's got a little tramp stamp. It's a scar that looks like a tattoo that looks like a dragon. So that was kind of, I must say, that was a really wild thing that has happened. Um, because spontaneous combustion doesn't happen a lot. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff has been seen on TV, some of the dark places that the Black Dahlia Murder House is really dark. Um, just two nights ago, I was at this place. Um, it's called the Cobb Estate. Um, it's in Altadena, which is kind of the hills of well, outside of Los Angeles. And it was some mogul had built it. And then the Marx Brothers lived there. And then it burned down. I thought there was going to be a state. It was just really a forest, a haunted forest. But something kept pushed me down twice. I literally, I'm, I'm like, I'm walking. Up. It's yes, we're in the dark, and yes, we're in the forest. Yes, we have all the equipment. Um, but it's like took a hit or twice, and I literally, you know, scraped hands, scraped palms, scraped knees, little almost black eye right here. But I looked on my shoulder, and I have literally the hand, a handprint on the back of my shoulder. It's like I knew I didn't just fall down. 
Wow. You know, so you got to be careful, and you people have to take it seriously, as you know, as being an investigator and doing this. Um, if you're, if you're, just know what you're playing with. Be smart. Get educated, and somehow, whether you buy, you know, ghost hunting for dummy, I, anything, have a working map. Know who you're going to call if you get scared or you get into trouble, or what you're going to call or what you're going to do. Again, you have to have your roadmap. That was definitely wild. Uh, the the flames, the marking, all that, and and that last part you said there. I mean, that really hits home because people are always contacting me on my channel saying, "How do I get in this field? What should I do?" And then I see other people that just jump in the field and have no clue. Um, you know, they've been a paranormal investigator for two weeks and they've got the T-shirts and the bumper sticker and hey, we're a team. And and I'm just like. Guys, you know, you really got to get in there, get your feet dirty, and, and, and then worry about all that, Make you know, making a name for yourself. But first, figure out what the hell you're trying to make a name on. So right. um, that, that was answered really well. I want to ask you something. Well, I want to ask you two more things, and then we'll wrap up here. One is, in 2019, I really want to get a seat at that table, and I would like to film at one of your seances. Um, I will fly in there. I will pay the, the fee. I would love to do that. And I know you guys would love to see that. So that's one thing I look forward to. I hope happens in 2019. Uh, two, do you mind if I turn on my portal box real quick and let's see if we have anything that would like to say hi to you? Yes, I yeah. love it. All right, we're going to turn on the portal box real quick uh, with Patty here. And we're going to see if anything comes through, which I think we know there will be. So I have Patty here with me. We've been talking. Have you been listening to us? Is there anything on her side that would be willing to come through and speak on my side? Can you tell us the name of the scooter? Something even through the airway of you, we're here in respect. Uh, we want to know who you are, and if you have any wisdom for us, or just any anecdotes. I like anecdotes. I like ghosts to tell me what they want to tell me that most people don't ask them. What would you like to tell us? Can you tell us anything you want. I do have a couple. One main one, her name is Adrian, the spirit in my house that can talk through your box. And But uh, there is a couple females. One, a girl who, who was an artist who I think passed here in this house, you know, years and years before even Adrian had it. So I don't know if her name was Jeanette or not. That did sound sort of like Jeanette. But would she like to talk to you? What about Adrian? Adrian, will you come talk to us? She's beautiful. She is so... Hi, Adrian. It sounded like... They only want to talk, Patty, when we're talking. <laughs> I know. Isn't that funny? The Ghost Adventures trying to do a live four-hour special. It was so thick in there because it was Halloween sound. And every time they'd have to go break to commercial is when the good stuff happened. Every time. Yeah, that would be the it's way like, that it works, absolutely. Going on, okay, they cut, they go somewhere else, or they have to go to commercial, and then, blah, what happened? It was hysterical. <laughs> Ghosts don't have good timing, or maybe they have really good timing and a really good sense of humor. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely think that sometimes, <clears throat> I felt that coming. Um, I know sometimes when we ask these questions, the responses come through minutes later, it, it, they get that energy up to answer it here. Um, and I think that's what it is, is when we're sitting here talking, by the time, you know, we're waiting for it to come through and we think nothing's happening, all of a sudden, bam. Can you say Patty's name or my name? Perfect example. What kind of entities do we have here?
Okay, Spirits, thank you for communicating with us here. I know I have to wrap up with Patty, but uh, I wanted to at least say that we did a, a session together. I know you guys will like that. Patty, thank you so much for doing this session with me. Uh, where can people check you out at? Um, they can find me, well, everywhere on social media. The base for that is pattynegri.com, P-A-T-T-I-N-E-G-R-I.com. Um, sign up for my monthly newsletter, which is just kind of a little magical thing. I give you tips and tricks and fun things to do to improve and enhance your life. I don't even try to sell anything. Um, Facebook, Patty Negri, but I have too many friends, so you could follow me there. I have Patty Negri Psychic Medium. You could like me there. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, all the usual. So, and then you can see what I'm doing. And yes, you have a place at my seance table the second you are here, my friend. I will create one round for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll even bring the portal box with me. We'll have a good old time. Do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>